Greetings everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We pray that this day finds you and your friends, loved ones, your family safe and in good health. Thank you for coming out as we continue with our Bible study on Bible prophecy. The last time we met, we talked about what the church would be doing in heaven after the rapture. And we said that there would be two events, two major events that's going to take place. And one would be the marriage supper of the Lamb, where Jesus will actually marry the church. And the other one would be standing before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, where we would be issued our rewards. In this Bible study today, we're going to see what's going to happen on earth while we are in heaven during this seven year period. That is what's going to be happening on earth here, which is called the tribulation, the seven year tribulation. So that's what we're going to talk about in this Bible study today. Let us first go before the throne of grace in prayer. Father in heaven, we are thankful that you blessed us, that we can come together today in the name of Jesus. We can continue to study your glorious word. We thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity that we can reach many more people through uh, social media. And we pray that you will bless everyone who is hearing and who is listening and who will see this message now or, or in the future, Lord, just bless us and help to go forth with power and might, help to touch everyone's heart in a special way, Lord, and we all will learn and grow and benefit from what you are saying to us here today. So we give you all honor, glory, and praise. We thank you, Lord. We pray to you and ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus, and we say amen. So before we get into our lesson for the day, let's rehearse what we've talked about uh, with our uh, timeline for Bible prophecy. If you look at your screen very carefully, you'll see the timeline of future events where we talk about what's going to happen with the church and with the, everyone else in the world, uh, what is right ahead of us right now. In fact, it's coming quite shortly. So if you look at your screen, you'll see under the letter A, there's the cross. That cross represents the beginning of the church in 33 AD. And that church which is the Church of God. It started and it went right on through to let us see. It was being persecuted throughout the entire time. It's almost 2,000 years now. It went right through with persecution up until the time of uh, Emperor Constantine when he made Christianity the official religion of the Christian Church. And then the persecution subsided somewhat, but then it picked back up again and the Church is being persecuted right now even to this day. The next major event which will happen is the rapture of the church. That's under letter C. And that's when Christ will come down in the clouds, not all the way down to earth, but he will come down in the clouds and he will call his church, snatch his church off the earth, up into heaven, take all of us back to heaven with him. There we will be for uh, at least seven years. And during that time, as we stated earlier, we will be standing before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, and we will be married to Christ. On earth at that time, let us see through E, we will be, the world, not us, not the church, but the world itself will be going through a seven-year tribulation period, which we will cover in detail today. At least we will start today. This is part one. We know that we will have to continue with, one, with the second part, maybe even three parts probably three parts. But when you look at letter F, that's the red arrow where Christ will come back at the end of the seven year tribulation. In fact, he will come back to put an end to the tribulation. One of the reasons he's coming back. And he will bring with him his church. We will come back with him and all of the heavenly hosts. When he comes down, that's the red arrow, letter E. When he comes down to earth, he will lock the, uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet up, and he will have Satan thrown into an abyss for 1,000 years. And that's where they will be through for the 1,000 year millennial period, which is letter E through G. And that's the 1,000 year period that we will reign with Christ from Jerusalem. He will set up a millennial temple, and that's where you and I, that's where the church is going to be working under Jesus Christ with authority and governorship over the entire world for that 1,000 year period. At the end of the 1,000 year period, which is letter G, uh, he will, Jesus will let Satan out of the abyss. Satan will 
gather up all of the people who were born during the 1,000 year millennial reign who did not accept Jesus. They're going to attack the Jewish people again. This time Christ will wipe them all out. He's going to throw them into the lake of fire. He will resurrect everybody who from Adam all the way up to the end of the millennial all the people who did who are not saved, who did not accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, who did not walk with God in the Old Testament, all of these people will be uh, judged at the great white throne judgment. And uh, this is found in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. They will be re uh, judged there, and all of these people will be sentenced to hell. At that time, Hades will be thrown into hell. Death will be thrown into hell. All of those people who are not saved will be thrown into hell. All evil will be put away. And uh, there will be no more crying, no more tears, cry, no more hurt, no more pain, no more suffering. All evil will be put away. And we will start the uh, into eternity with Jesus Christ. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. And we move right on into eternity with Jesus Christ. That's the timeline of what's going to happen to the church and to the world. And we like to bring this out each time because we figured that all Christians should know what, what's going to be happening, what's going to be coming. So now, let's go to the, our lesson for today and let's see what we are going to be talking about the tribulation. This is the seven year period that we are on earth. Uh, they're not we, but the people on earth. We are in heaven. The church is in heaven with Jesus Christ. But Everyone else is on earth, and they will be going through a seven-year tribulation period. Now, just what is the tribulation? The tribulation itself is uh, a seven-year period that begins after the rapture of the church, and it goes up until the end of the, uh, with the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's when it ends. When Jesus Christ comes back down and put an end to it, he said, if he doesn't come back down and put an end to it, no flesh will be saved alive. In this time, there will be false preachers, there will be wars, there will be famine or hunger. People are going to be starving. Uh, there, there are going to be uh, earthquakes, massive earthquakes all over the world. All kind of cosmic disturbances that's going to be going on over the world. Uh, stars and falling from the sky, and sun not giving light, moon turning black, and that kind of thing. And uh, all of that's going to be happening on the earth. Half the people on the earth are going to die during this seven-year period. So you're going to have billions of people that die uh, during this seven-year period. Now then, we will be covering that in detail. If you look at this timeline again, the letter C through E, that's that seven-year tribulation period that we are talking about when all of this is going to be happening on earth. The book of Revelation, Jesus gives an outline in, in, of the, what's going to happen on during the seven year tribulation period. But this is just a general broad outline. Um, he did this in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke chapter 21. But in the book of Revelation, John gives a detailed explanation of what's going to happen during the seven year period, which we will cover in a moment. But during this seven year period, um, John explains what's going to be going on in greater detail, uh, the book of Revelation has 22 chapters. 16 of these chapters explain in detail what's going to be happening from Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 through Revelation chapter 19 uh, and verse 10. So we're going to be covering those chapters. Uh, uh, we'll start covering those chapters today. So that's what... Uh, what we're going to be talking about, everything that we're going to be talking about is going to be focused between letters C and E, uh, oh, the, the tribulation itself. So this chart here that we're going to look at now, the, all of this is fitting right in between uh, uh, letters C and E. But let's just look at the main part of it is focused on between letters C and E. We put letters at the bottom so you can see what's happening and we can try to tie it in with the overall timeline that we talked about earlier. If you look at letter A, you'll see it's directly, right above it is the cross itself. Uh, that, that's the beginning of the church. Then right next to that is, uh, is the actual rapture of the church. That's under letter B, or above letter B. That's that little arrow that shapes like a fish hook. And that's the actual rapture of the church. That's the next step that we're going to be talking about, uh, the next step that the church will be going through. 
After the rapture of the church, we'll start the seven year tribulation. That's letters B through C. That box you see with the red outlines on it is the first half of the tribulation, three and a half years. That's what's represented here with that three and a half year, with that red box and the arrows that are pointing out. That's the three and a half years of the first three and a half years. Then you come to the midpoint, which is letter C. That's the midpoint of the tribulation. Terrible things are going to be happening there because the Antichrist is going to go into the temple of the Jewish people. He's going to claim to be Christ and get tell everybody to worship him because he is Christ. And then terrible things are going to happen from that point on because now we go into the second three and a half year of the tribulation. And this is called the Great Tribulation. Uh, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 21, Jesus referred to the last three and a half years of the tribulation as the Great Tribulation because this is where the most catastrophic, horrendous events are going to take place. And like we said, uh, billions of people are going to die. Half the people on earth are going to die within that time period. So you got the first three and a half years of the tribulation, which is going to be relatively... Uh, calm, even though there will be deaths and terrible things going on then, but the last half of the tribulation is when the real horrendous catastrophic events are going to take place. And it would end uh, at the return of Jesus Christ, and that would be uh, right there on the letter D, when Christ returns back and then we move on into the millennial period, letter D through E. And this is how we're going to be doing it. So then, Let's go to our next slide. What's the purpose for the tribulation? The purpose for the tribulation, there are several purposes for the tribulation. First of all, uh, God is going to judge the world. He's going to judge the world uh, because of the world's sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3 and verse 23. God gave to everybody on earth thousands of years, everybody who's ever been born and received thousands of years to come to him. To, ch to change from sin. He sent prophets out. They, a lot of times they killed the prophets or they ignored the prophets. He sent Jesus Christ. Of course, we know that he crucified Jesus. And uh, he has preachers and teachers today that are teaching, trying to get people to come to him. Everything God is doing is trying to get people to come to him. That's what he's trying to do. He's preparing us to come into eternity with him. But right, the tribulation itself is when he's beginning to wrap things up. He's going to bring judgment on the whole world at this period because of the sin. And for those people who don't accept Jesus Christ, those are the ones who will be going through the tribulation. The second purpose of the tribulation is for God to bring the Jewish people back into a relationship with Him. Now, God chose the Jewish people to be an example for the rest of the world. That's why you had so much about the Jewish people. He did this not because they were, the Jewish people were greater or better or, or larger in number than anyone else, but because of Abraham. God loved Abraham and he made a promise to Abraham that he would take care of his, uh, Abraham's descendants. What he would do is uh, make Abraham descendants blessed by giving them special land, giving them special privileges and so forth, so that they, in, the, in the hopes that they would be a light to the rest of the world, all of the other nations around the world. Of course, they didn't do this. God said, look, you guys don't do it. I'm going to run you out of your land. And he did this three different times. And uh, they, now he's trying to get the Jewish people to come back to him still. There's, but there's going to be another Holocaust. There was one in World War II. Uh, the Jewish people have always been persecuted. And uh, they began coming back into the land, but then after World War II, they came in mass numbers. But uh, there's going to be another Holocaust where two-thirds of the Jewish people are going to be killed. This is during the tribulation period. Two-thirds are going to die, and when you see Jesus say it's, where he's going to bring the remnants of the Jews back, that's the one-third of the Jewish people that he's going to bring back to him during the seven year when he comes back at the end of the seven year tribulation period. But two thirds of those people are going to get killed as Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 8. So he's going to come back, the purpose of the tribulation is to bring the Jewish people back to him, the remnant, those that are left, which will be only be one third of what's, uh, what's alive today. Also, the third reason he's going to bring the Gentiles back in, into a relationship with him. Because the Gentiles uh, didn't. 
didn't do their job. They didn't come to God as well. Who are the Gentiles? The Gentiles is anyone that's not a Jew or a Christian. And from God's perspective, there are only three groups of people in the world. Jews, Gentiles, and the church, Christians. That's all. Jews, Gentiles, and Christians. That, we know that from 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 32. If a Gentile becomes a Christian, he's no longer a Gentile. He's a Christian now, a new creature in Christ Jesus. If a Jew becomes a Christian, that Jew is no longer a Jew. That Jew is a new creature in Christ Jesus, that Jew is a Christian. So you got three different groups of people, and God sent three different prophets to tell exactly what's going to happen to each one of these groups of people. Daniel tell what's going to happen to the Gentiles. Uh, Ezekiel tell what's going to happen to the Jews. The book of Revelation tell what's going to happen to the church. So this God is going to come back for the tribulation. Uh, during the tribulation period, he's going to uh, bring judgment on the Gentiles in an effort to bring the Gentiles uh, to him again. This is the last effort he's going to be made to bring the Gentiles to him. So you see what's going to happen to the Jews, what's going to be happening to the Gentiles. And the fourth reason for the tribulation is God is going to usher in the return of his son Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to be coming back. Thank God we can praise God for that because that's the only time there's going to be peace and, uh, on earth. So those are the four primary reasons for purposes for the tribulations. Uh, if you do research on this, you'll see sometimes they'll say there are two purposes for the tribulation, or sometimes you'll see them, they'll say there are seven or eight purposes for the tribulation. That's because of the way they break it down. You can break it down in all kinds of different ways, or you could, uh, you could narrow it down or sort of summarize it. But we put these four together like this so you can see the overall thing without going too much into detail with uh, each little uh, purpose. So those are the purposes for the tribulation. Uh, from our perspective. Now, Jesus gave an outline of the tribulation uh, in Matthew chapter 24. And uh, you can read that on the screen there. And what he says was this. Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives talking to his disciples. And uh, he was telling them all the terrible things that's going to be happening. He was telling, talking about the tribulation. And they were saying, well, you know, tell us. When will these things be? When will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? So they asked him, when is all of this going to happen? And when are you coming back? What's going to be the sign? And Jesus answered them, and he said, he gave them several different reasons, uh, several different events to look for just before his second coming. But then he said, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. The beginning of birth pains. That's important to understand because he gave these events to them and he told them when you see these things beginning, they're just like a woman in labor. The, the, the end is not yet, but this is the beginning of the end. So let's look at what he told them that's going to be happening and, uh, and let's talk about each one of these for a moment. First he said there would be false messiahs. False messiahs, or, to the, or what we would call false preachers. There are false teachers out. And there are many of these out today. Uh, you got, they just started all the way back during Jesus' day. You had the uh, Judaizers and the uh, Gnostics. This was already in the first century. Today, we have many false preachers out. We have many Christian cults. In the United States alone, there are over 3,000 Christian cults. And there are over 30 million people in the United States, Christians, who are in Christian cults and don't even realize they are in Christian cults. Next year, when we get into some of the Christian apologetic topics, we're going to explain what Christian cults really are and the significance of uh, Christian cults. But Jesus said there would be false messiahs or false preachers, we would say today. They're false preachers. And there are literally uh, thousands of these right now, not just in the United States, but around the world. And then he told them that there would be wars. There have been many, many wars. Wars have already always been going on. In fact, over the past 3,400 years, there have only been 286 years. Out of that 3,400 years, there have only been 286 years where there was no war. Only 286 out of 3,400 years where people have not been you know, warring and fighting and killing each other. So uh, you can see how significant that is. And now these wars are continuing if you count all of the battles and the skirmishes and so forth that's going on. There, in the 20th century alone, there's been over 108 million people killed. 
This is an estimate. Over 108 million people killed. Now these wars are going to continue. They're not going to stop at all. There have been many efforts and so forth to try to stop the wars and that the League of Nations and the United Nations and all of these organizations, international organizations, trying to stop wars. They can forget it. They're not going to stop because the way of peace they know not, the Bible tells us. And it makes this very, very clear. Now, he also said that there would be famine or hunger. There would be lack of food. Whenever there are wars going on, there's not going to be food around because you can't plant anything. The food that's already available, you can't package it. You can't distribute it to the stores. So people are going to be starving to death. Right now, we have famine in the world, famine in the United States. Uh, right now, there are approximately 40 million people that go to bed hungry in the United States or in poverty. In the United States alone, every single year, approximately 40 million people. Um, worldwide, it comes to about 820 million people that are starving. But this famine will continue to go on and on and on. It will not stop. Then he said there would be pestilences and earthquakes. Pestilence and the diseases. We've had epidemics, we've had pandemics, there was SARS, there was uh, Ebola, uh, there was the swine flu. Uh, right now we've got COVID-19, and we see this going on and on. These will continue. Okay, There will be different uh, diseases and pandemics and epidemics that will come, and they will continue on and on and on, right up to the time as we move into the tribulation itself. Then there, he said there would be earthquakes, and there have been significant earthquakes. There would be increase in earthquakes. Um, the, if you, the, United, the U.S. Uh, Geological Survey is an organization, a government organization, that keeps track of earthquakes. Later on, sometimes we get into our apologetic topics, or even while we're in prophecy, we'll show you a graph of how the earthquakes are increasing. You probably wouldn't notice them just from the weather or from observing the news and so forth. You actually have to see the graphs and see how they have been increasing over the years. Remember what Jesus said. He said these things are like birth pains, which means that when a woman is in labor, her pains become more intense and frequent as she gets closer and closer to the day of delivery. And that's what Jesus means when he says these things will be like birth pains. So what we're seeing here with all of these seven items that are mentioned here, at least the first six, they will be increasing more and more and more as we get closer and closer to the time of delivery, the time of the tribulation. So that's what we are work, working toward right now. We're moving closer and closer and closer to the tribulation. That's what, what is happening here. So that's why we're bringing these out to you so you can know. So now there are also martyrs. He said there would be martyrs. Martyrs are Christians who died for the name of Jesus. Many Christians are dying. There are approximately 90 Christians that are getting killed. They get killed every single year uh, around the world. In the past 10 years, there were over 900,000 Christians estimated to, be, to have been killed. And Christians are getting killed every day. Not so much here in the, in the, in the uh, north where we are, not in the United States, but in many of the other countries, usually Muslim countries, a lot of Christians are being killed. Some of the countries in Africa, uh, even down in uh, South America, sometimes you'll hear this. But uh, in, in, in also parts of Eastern Europe, Christians are being martyred. This will continue as well. Christians will continue to get killed. Christians will continue to die. It's coming here to the United States as well. Okay, God is just holding it up a little bit, but we can see the trend coming toward this right now. We have many people right now in the head of government in the United States who cannot stand Christians. The Christians are in the way of their agenda and what they are trying to accomplish. So you can be sure that this is reaching the United States. Okay, They're trying to shut us up right now, but some of us will die. We have to be ready, be expecting it, because it's coming. Then uh, there are cosmic disturbances before Jesus comes. Cosmic disturbances when there's things that are happening up in the, uh, up in the, the uh, atmosphere, up in the sky. There will be the moon turning black, the sun not giving us blood, the sun turning black, the moon turning red, stars falling from the sky and so forth. All of these things are going to be happening just before the second coming. A lot of this will happen during the second half of the tribulation. 
But Jesus is letting them know what to happen. Remember, Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation. So when you get right to the second half of the tribulation, we're going to see, or the world is going to see a whole lot of us. The church will be in heaven. And we'll come back with Jesus when he comes. The church will be in heaven, of course. Now, also, the seventh item we have here is the inauguration of the second coming. That's Jesus coming back. When he comes back, he will bring you, bring the church with him. You and I will come back with him, all the holy angels. That's when Jesus will come back. When Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, and he was telling the disciples, they asked him the question, what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? People ask that question today. Well, is this the end of the age? When is something coming back? When is Jesus coming back? They always ask that question when something happens like the pandemic that we are going through now, COVID-19, or some other catastrophic event that takes place. They will always ask, us, I wonder if this is the sign of the end time. Are we in the end time and everything? We always go by the Bible, and the closest we can get to that is what we are look, talking about right now. Jesus told us exactly what to look for, but remember what he said. When we see these things happening, these are the beginning of birth pains. You know, so the birth pains of a woman, once again, it becomes more frequent and more intense as she gets closer and closer to the delivery date. So as we get closer and closer to the second coming, you can see these events that we have listed here. Uh, you can see them increasing in intensity, in frequency and intensity. So we can expect that to come. Now, there are two main events that must take place before the tribulation begins. Um... One is that uh, the, there must be a resurrected Roman Empire. And the second one is there must be a leader. The Antichrist has to come on the scene. There must be a resurrected Roman Empire. Uh, from the time of Daniel, there were four empires. Uh, there was the Babylonian Empire, which was overtaken by the Medes and the Persians. Or, uh, they defeated the Babylonian Empire. Then the Medes and the Persians were defeated by the Greece, uh, the Greco-Macedonian Empire, that was Greece, and Alexander the Great and his crew, they took over the Medes and the Persians, and after that came the Roman Empire. Well, the Roman Empire, no one ever took over the Roman Empire. No one ever defeated it. The Roman Empire just destroyed itself from within. It, it, with uh, corruption in government, uh, rioting, debauchery, drunken partying, uh, and living lives of indulgence and so forth. They just destroyed themselves from within. Something like the United States is doing today. Everybody knows that the United States is destroying itself from within. It's not prophesied that the United States is going to be hit from without so much, even though that could happen. But we are actually destroying ourselves from within. And that will continue to happen. That's why the United States is not mentioned in Bible prophecy. It will be reduced to insignificance or either completely wiped out and there are several different reasons for that we went going through them before but we'll be covering this again but the roman empire itself uh no one ever defeated it it went down itself it destroyed itself from within but daniel chapter 2 and 7 said there there will be 10 nations that come out of this uh they got get together again and those 10 nations are going to form uh what be in prophecy called a resurrected Roman Empire. So there's going to be another, this final uh, empire in the world is going to be this resurrected, before Jesus sets up his kingdom of course, there's going to be a resurrected Roman Empire and that's that has to happen um, before the tribulation starts because once the resurrected Roman Empire is in place they have to have a leader. The leader of that Roman Empire will be called the Antichrist. He is going to be the Antichrist. Now, um, we'll say more about that in just a second, but that's the Bible gives ten names for the Antichrist, and uh, he's going to sign a treaty with Israel. Now, look, if you look at this slide you see here now, that's the Roman Empire at its height. That's If you notice the burgundy part on your screen, that's the Roman Empire covered that whole area. Right after it defeated the uh, Greco-Macedonian Empire, that's when it was. That Roman Empire controlled the whole world for over a thousand years. You can see it covers all of Europe, uh, parts of Asia, or uh, parts of North Africa. I mean, it was really ruling the world. The Roman Empire was around during Jesus' day as well. It ended in about 476 uh, A.D., somewhere around that. That's when the Roman Empire ended. But actually, it was very powerful and it lasted for a long time. But notice the geographical area that it covered. It covered uh, the 
all of Europe, parts of Asia, north, parts of North uh, Africa, and also the British Isles, part of the British Isles up there, and so forth. Now, we know that the European, when the European Union is the foundation for the resurrected Roman Empire. Look at the geographical area that the Rome, the European Union come. Pretty much the same area. You got all of Europe there, parts of Asia, and uh, doesn't get down into North Africa. But this is the European Union today. The European Union is composed of 27 nations. There were 28, but England left the European Union in January. So uh, Daniel said that there are going to be 10 nations. So somehow, these 27 nations that are left in the European Union are going to be reconfigured into 10, or either some of these nations out of that 27 are going to be leaving the European Union, and they're going to let, let, uh, end up with 10 left. So this is what's going to be happening. But those 10 nations are in place that the European Union, the foundation for the resurrected Roman Empire, is the European Union. Uh, Bible scholars and prophecy scholars are pretty much unanimous in agreement with that. We know this is coming, uh, and we know that they have the foundation for it. They're having meetings, and they're talking about it, and so forth, and nations are leaving. And it's sort of whittling down right now to uh, end up becoming ten nations. Now, once they get these ten nations, they're going to have to select a leader. That leader is called the Antichrist. That leader will be called, the Bible calls the leader the Antichrist. In the Bible, there are ten, about ten different names for the Antichrist. But uh, we'll cover those and we'll talk about the Antichrist in detail in a future lesson. But um, the leader is going to be, right now the European Union doesn't have a president. As some of the various institutions and, and, and commissions in the European Union have presidents. But there's no one president over the whole thing. They're going, once they whittle down into ten nations, they're going to elect one president, and that will be the Antichrist. Now, what starts the tribulation? The tribulation is going to start, the clock starts ticking, the moment the Antichrist signs a treaty with Israel. The moment he confirms a treaty with Israel, that starts the seven-year tribulation period. 2,520 days, 360 days is in a Jewish year, which is what we go by, what the Bible goes by. So that comes to 2,520 days. The moment that Antichrist confirms a treaty with Israel, he's not going to start a new treaty. There are several treaties out there right now, but they're not being activated or adhered to by the pre treaty partners. We got the Oslo Treaty, uh, there are, uh, there's the, um, the, the Jordanian Israeli Peace Treaty with, uh, under Bill Clinton, um, there's the one under uh, Jimmy Carter, there are at least three different treaties out there today. And uh, the Camp David Accord Treaty, I think that was in the, about 1979 with Jimmy Carter and then uh, uh, Bill Clinton did two of them himself. One was the Oslo Accord and one the other was the Jordanian Peace Treaty. So there are three treaties out there now. And uh, earlier this, about a couple of weeks ago, President Trump signed another treaty with the Israeli people. And that was between Israel, uh, the United Arab Emirates, and also uh, Bahrain. So these countries are, are signing more and more treaties with Israel. And there are plenty more countries, according to the president, President Trump, that want to come in and sign. So one of these treaties is going to be confirmed by the Antichrist. Because no, they're signing these peace treaties, but nobody's really adhering to them. They stick to them for maybe a couple of months, or maybe a year or so, but then they get right back in the war. There'll never be war in the Middle East until Jesus returns. Period. And when we are living there, that's when there'll, there'll be peace. But... Uh, the Antichrist is going to confirm one of these treaties. He's going to meet with the heads of, uh, of Israel, and he's going to say, look, we're going to sign this treaty here. We're going to confirm one of these treaties, whichever one it is, we don't know. They're not going to start a new treaty, because it takes years to start a treaty. It takes years to uh, draw up a treaty, meet a treaty, there are many, many meetings and everything. Uh, we did tax treaties. Uh, with different countries, we have income tax treaties, and we have to review them, we have to meet with officials from the t other different countries and so forth, and it takes years to do this, and then they have to be signed by the President of the United States. Well, with these peace treaties, there are many different uh, avenues to get to them as well, so it takes years. But we know that 
the, the, the Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27 said it, 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 uh, the Antichrist is going to confirm a treaty. In other words, the treaty is already going to be in existence. So all he has to do is confirm it. And he's going to meet with the head of Israel and he's going to tell him, say, look, this is, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to confirm this treaty. We're going to reactivate it. And we're going to adhere to it and so forth. That's the beginning of the tribulation. That's the beginning of the seven years right then. That's when the clock starts ticking on, on, on that. Now, the there's one other thing that must happen. There must be a temple built, which we call the tribulation temple. This is the Jewish temple that must be must be uh, done. Uh, there were there have been uh, three temples already. Uh, one, the first was built by King Solomon, but it was destroyed by the Babylonians in 587. There was uh, the second temple was built uh, not as elaborate as the first, but it was completed in 515. It lasted about 500 years or so. It wasn't too big of a deal with this particular temple. Then King Herod built one in 64 AD. This was the one that was destroyed by uh, King Titus, by General Titus of Rome. The Roman Empire was in place there. They came in, they sacked Jerusalem, tore down the temple. The Jews fled. They fled all over the world. And that was the last time the Jews ran away. God said, I will bring you back in the last days. He sent several different prophets to tell them that. There are at least three or four different prophets in the Bible. So he would bring the Jews back. The Jews started coming back all, uh, as early as the 1800s on the, uh, the Zionist movement, Theodore Herschel. And, but in World War II, they really came back in mass numbers. Uh, in May 14, 1948, they announced a new state of Israel, and now the Jews are back in Israel. Some of them are still going back. There are a few still scattered all over the world, but they're coming back into Israel. They're going to build another temple. This temple, we, what we call the Tribulation Temple. This temple um, is already in place. They have all the blueprints ready. They have all the implements for... Of, for sacrificing in the temple, they have already selected uh, 24,000 priests. All the priests are studied in the book of Leviticus. They, re they know how to carry out, uh, administer the, the, the worship in the temple. I mean, they got everything ready. In fact, they got a website called uh, templeinstitute.org. And they keep you can keep informed of what's going on with the temple. If you look at a map, or if you've been to Jerusalem, or if you look at um, a map of Jerusalem, you'll see the Dome of the Rock. On, at a certain area there, uh, that area is the Temple Mount. That's where the Jewish Temple is supposed to be built. So somehow that Dome of the Rock is going to be destroyed. It has to be taken down. It has to come down because the Jewish Temple is going to be put there. That's the Tribulation Temple. That's something else that's going to happen uh, just before the Tribulation starts or right in the first part of the Tribulation. That's when it's going to, that's, that also has to happen because the Antichrist has to have a temple. When the Antichrist signs that the treaty with Israel, he, one of the things that's going to be in there is that the Jews could go and worship in their temple. So the temple has to be in place for that to happen. Now then, what is going to happen in the tribulation? Well, the Apostle John was on the Isle of Patmos. He was exiled there by the Roman Emperor Domitian uh, for preaching the gospel and so forth. So they put him on the Isle of Patmos. They put all the prisoners out there. He wasn't the only one there. They sent prisoners out there. While he was out there, God showed him a vision. John saw Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ took him in a vision from the first century all the way up to the 21st century and showed him what's going to be happening. And he told John to write down what you see. And John wrote this down in the book of Revelation. And he saw Jesus with a scroll in his hand. And there were seven seals on the scroll. Those seven seals, Jesus opened one by one. Jesus was the only one who had the authority and the power to open these seals. So each time he opened a seal, he would show John something that was going to happen during the seven-year tribulation. And each one of these seals uh, represent a very catastrophic event. And each time he opened one seal, then he opened the second seal, and each, each seal was one worse than the other. He also showed them trumpets and bowls. We refer to those as the seven seal judgment, the seven trumpet judgment, and the seven bowl judgments. But there are seven of each one. And each time he opened it, today we'll, try to, we'll cover the seal judgments, and next time we'll get to the rest of them. But the seal judgments, he, he opened number one, Jesus opened number one, John saw something happen. Opened number two, he saw something even worse. Something three, and so forth and so on, until he got to the seventh. When he got to the seventh seal, that opened up the, the next sequence of seal of trumpets 
which would be seven trumpets. Then he went through the first trumpet, second trumpet, third trumpet, fourth trumpet. When he got the seventh trumpet, they got to the seven bowls, and then when he pulled up the first bowl, second bowl, so forth and so forth. So that's how, how, how this was going on. So first Jesus started with the seals. Now let's see what the seals are, and let's see what happened after he opened each seal. Remember, each time he, he opened a seal, something worse happened each time. Now, the first seal, he said, there's John writing. John is trying to write. John is a first century person trying to write where we could understand it today. John said, then I saw a lamb. Then, then I saw when the lamb broke out one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, come. I look, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Now that white horse is uh, a rider on that horse with a bull. That white horse, in the first century, a white horse was a symbol of a conquering military leader. So he was, John saw this powerful leader on this horse, this white horse. And a lot of people believe it was Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ returns on a white horse. And of course, he, none is no more powerful than Jesus Christ himself. So a lot of people believe that, John, uh, that this is the first, uh, that this first horse is Jesus himself. But actually it's not. This is someone masquerading as Jesus, counterfeiting. It's a counterfeit Jesus. He is called the Antichrist. You're looking at the Antichrist. And this is where he begins his reign. Right after that first seal, riding that white horse, he's going to take control of the world. This is what his, his reign is. That's the first seal. The second seal John saw, he's, John said, when he broke the second seal, they talking about Jesus, Jesus pulling them seals off and showing him what happened. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come, and another, a red horse went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that man would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. The second red horse symbolizes war. War. This is very serious business now. We're getting into actual war. These wars are going to be going happening all over the world. But notice what happened here with the second seal. In the second seal, it was granted to take peace from the earth, in other words, war, and that man would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. This is the red horse. Now, that man would slay one another and a great sword. So that sword is a symbol of military weapons to kill to kill people, to take life away. And this is what's going to be happening with the Red Horse. The war begins, the war starts, and everything is going to just, it's going to be terrible right from that point on. Then Jesus opened the third seal. And the third seal said this, when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come, I look, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and wine. In other words, food is going to be so scarce that you have to weigh every little thing. That's that scale that that rider has in his hand. You have to weigh every little bit of food, every little bit that you could, everything that you eat, because there's just not going to be any food around for them, for people to eat. And notice what he said. He uh, said, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. A denarius was uh, a day's wage, just equal to about 16 cents. And uh, a quart of wheat, you could buy one meal for a day's wages. And then if you bought three meals for a denarius, uh, you could have three quarts of barley, but you'd have to cover three meals, but you wouldn't have any money left for anything else. No oil or wine or anything to cook food or any necessities that are necessary. So that's what death, that's that, that famine that's in, in, in place there. After the war, there's always famine. Famine always comes because there's just no food to eat. But it gets worse. The next seal is the fourth seal. Fourth seal, when Jesus opened the seal, fourth seal, John wrote, when the Lamb broke the fourth, the Lamb, of course, is Jesus Christ. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come, I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and he who sat on him had the name Death, 
and Hades was falling with them. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by a wild beast of the earth. Now, notice what happened here. A ashy horse, or some translations say a pale horse. Pale is not a natural color. Pale is the color of death, an ashy horse. And death always follows our famine and so forth. But notice what happened here with this death part. It said he had the name Death and Hades were following him. Hades is the place where people go when they die today who are not saved. Uh, it's, a, it's a holding place for them. That's Hades. So uh, he said authority, but notice what the, one of the key things here. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth. Notice why. To kill with sword famine with pestilence and the wild beasts. So they're not just dying with sword from fighting in the war, they also die with famine, no food to eat, but there's also pestilence, diseases and pandemics and epidemics. But not only that, the wild beasts of the earth. You got the wild animals, they're going to be hungry too, they're not going to have food. Consider all the animals today in the jungles of South America and Africa and so forth. You got the hyenas and lions and tigers and bears and so forth. All these animals are going to be hungry too. So what do they eat during this time? People, what well, they can find them. So people are going to be eaten by these animals. This is where one-fourth of the earth is going, one-fourth of people right here are going to die. Another one-fourth comes later, which we'll cover. But half the people on the earth are going to die during this time. Right now, the population of the world is about seven and a half billion. If uh, half the people were, if this were to happen now, uh, half the people were to die, you'd have about uh, 3.75 billion people would die. That's a lot of people. That's more than North America, Central America, and South America combined. So you're going to have all of these people, billions of them, literally being perished by famine and by war and by the beasts of the earth and by diseases, epidemics and pandemics and so forth. All of this is going to be killing the people on earth. It's going to be a terrible time. In fact, Jesus says it's going to be the time that was worse than any other time ever was on the earth and never will be again. That's that fourth horse. So we got four horses referred to frequently as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You got the white horse, the phony uh, antichrist counterfeiting as Jesus. You got the red horse, which is symbolizing war. You got the black horse, which symbolizes famine. There's not going to be any food left because famine always follows war. Then you got the pale horse, which is death itself. Those are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now there are only four seals already. These four horsemen ride with these four seals. So you got three seals left. What is the fifth seal? John said, when the fifth seal opened, the Lamb broke the fifth seal, and I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God, and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, on those, how long, uh, O Lord, Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while long until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. What John is seeing here now is those people who are in the tribulation, this is not the church, but these are people who are saved. There will be people that turn to Christ during the tribulation. These people are going to be saved during the tribulation itself. The Antichrist is going to kill as many of these people as they can. That's those souls that John is talking about that he sees under the altar. And they're up there in heaven now saying, asking Jesus Christ, how long is it going to be before you put an end to this, Lord? How long is it going to be before you avenge our death? And the uh, Jesus have the angels tell them, they give them white robes, which is a symbol of salvation and purity. You say, you just hold on a little while longer because more Christians are have to be killed on earth first. Your brethren down there are going to have to die first. So he's going to let he's letting them know what's going to be happening in heaven. That's that fifth seal. So you can see this is a terrible, terrible time that's happening here on earth. He's letting the brethren know what's going on, what's going to be happening down there on earth. More people have to be killed. That's the fifth seal. Then we get to the sixth seal. Sixth seal, see he John's John wrote he John said he I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. Great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair. The whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the, to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs, when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split 
apart like a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island removed out of its place. You can see now the cosmic disturbances, things that are happening, the sun coming black, the moon turning red like blood, stars falling from the sky. I'll tell you, this alone will give a person a heart attack if you are on earth having to go through the tribulation. Nothing else has to happen. You don't even have to die from the famine. Just the cosmic disturbances will cause you to have a heart attack. You see all of these things that are really happening on the, that's the sixth seal. But that's not all of the sixth seal. There's more cosmic disturbances. They're the kings of the earth and the rich men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid himself in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains and they tried, they said to the mountains and to the rock, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? Your money will do you no good. You see rich people running. You see slaves and poor people running. Everybody on earth is running. People, in other words, people are trying to kill themselves. People are trying to commit suicide. They hide in the rocks, telling the rocks to fall on the mountain. This is John trying to explain it, how, what's, how these people are trying to kill themselves. Today we would say, oh, they tried to commit suicide, you know. But that's what's going to be happening on earth. And John was explaining it in his verse that they tell the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them from the face of the Lamb. This judgment of Jesus Christ saying, now I'm coming on the earth. And they say, who is able to stand? In other words, there's no one, no one. Who could, who could escape the judgment of God. The only one that can escape the judgment of God is those who are followers of Jesus Christ and those who are saved. Those are the ones who will escape this judgment. And even some of them will be killed by the Antichrist as we saw in the, in the, in the uh, sixth seal, uh, in the fifth seal a little while ago. So then, that's the sixth seal with cosmic disturbances. We still got one more seal to go. Uh, but before we get to that seal, there is 144,000, and I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God, and he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond service of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. What is happening here is while the tribulation is going on, God is going to seal a hundred. 44,000 Jewish males, Jewish males, and when he sealed them, that means that they can't be hurt or touched by the tribulation. They're saved. Their job will be to preach the gospel out to the whole world. The gospel is going to go over the whole world, uh, and this is how many people are going to be saved because they're still going to be hearing the gospel. The, uh, the gospel is going to be uh, preached over the world three, three different times during the tribulation. You have two witnesses that's going to be preaching it. You have the 144,000 that's going to be preaching it right here. And also we have an angel in Revelation chapter 14 that's going to be getting the gospel out. But this 144,000, they're going to be 12,000 from each one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And they're going to be sealed. They're going to be protected. And they're going to be preaching the gospel out. Then we move on into... Uh, before we hit the seventh seal, because the seventh seal is going to usher in the trumpets, but if you, you remember what we said when Jesus explained to the disciples when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives and asked them when are these things going to be and what shall be the sign of your coming in the end of the age, well, he, he give these events that are going to be happening, and then he, uh, we, we, when we get to Revelation, John gives greater detail of what's going to be happening. Well, you can see it here on this chart. What, what he said, if you look at the false crisis in Revelation chapter 24, when Jesus told him, that's the rider on the white horse. You've got wars and rumors of wars, that's the rider on the red horse in Revelation. The famine, uh, Matthew 24, verse 7, that's the rider on the black horse in Revelation. Famine and plagues that Jesus told him about, that's the rider on the pale horse. Jesus told him there would be persecutions and martyrdom in Revelation, that's uh, the martyrs in, in chapter 6. And then he told them there would be terror and cosmic signs. We see that in Revelation chapter 6. Worldwide preaching the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom is going to go out to the whole world as a witness. And that is the, in, in, in Revelation uh, chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. That's the gospel. So you can see the parallel between Matthew 24, what Jesus said was a general outline, and how John went into detail with these 
uh, events that are going to be happening uh, on earth. Then we come to the this, this last of the seals, which is the seventh seal. And, G and John wrote, when the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. Now notice what it says in verse uh, in, in, in verse uh, in, in two there. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Now it's ushering in the seven trumpets. But before that, in verse eight, he said. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And a half an hour doesn't seem like a long time. But just remember what's going on here. All of these catastrophic events, cosmic disturbances, earthquakes, sun turning red, moon turning black, sun not giving light, uh, all of the killing and the wars and the famine and the pestilence and so forth going on, all of that's just happening. And all of a sudden, boom, everything stops and just gets quiet. Nothing happened for half an hour. What is going on now? That's what happened is the people on earth are just, when you see something like that happen, you're just frightened to death because you don't know what the next shoe is going to drop. You don't know when it's going to drop. You don't know what's happening. So that half hour there will put fright in you like nothing ever before. It seemed like thousands of years because you're just waiting for the next event that's going to happen. You don't see all these catastrophic events that are occurring and all of a sudden, silence. Nothing. That's enough right there to take your breath away. That's enough to give you a heart attack because you're anticipating the next horrendous catastrophic event. Don't know what it's going to be, so you're scared to death. But what happens is, it's now the, the trumpet's going to come in. The seven trumpets are going to come in, so the angel begin to blow his trumpet. So that last seal is going to usher in the uh, seventh trumpet, and now... Uh, that's when they take over, the angels take over blowing the seven trumpets. And each time the trumpet blows, another catastrophic event. And we'll pick it up there next time. Hopefully you'll be with us. And, uh, and uh, we thank you for coming with us today. But let us go before the throne of grace in prayer. Father, we are thankful that you blessed us today that we can be continue uh, our study in Bible prophecy. We can discuss what happened in the tribulation. Thank you for giving us this knowledge and information and giving us details on this as you give to the Apostle John in the book of Revelations. Lord, we thank you that we are able to understand it. We know that you did tell us that the understanding would increase during the end time, and we are grateful that you've given us this understanding that we can know. Help us to take this knowledge, help us to take these words, and help us to use them in our lives, Lord. Help us to meditate on them, and help us to read and do further research with this, and get a deeper understanding, Lord, so that we could uh, be a witness for Jesus Christ, and be able to give an answer for the hope that is within us, and do it with gentleness and respect, and that we can let others know what is going on and what's going to be happening. We just thank you so much, Lord, for blessing us in this way, and we just ask your continued blessings on us. Bless everyone who's listening, everyone who will be listening, and that they will benefit significantly, and that we all will benefit significantly from this lesson here today. So we thank you, we pray to you, and ask it all in Jesus Christ's holy and sacred name, and we say amen. So again, we thank you for coming and joining us. We look very much forward to you being with us next time. We'll be together in two weeks again, and we'll continue again with the uh, trumpets as we go through what's going to be happening on the tribulation. Remember, you and I will not be here if you see it. If you're in Christ Jesus, you don't have to worry about any of this. So uh, you could uh, let your friends and family and relatives know that they don't have to be in the need. If they don't know Christ, be a witness to them. Let them know how much Jesus loved them. And bring them out so that they too can learn and grow and they can be saved. They don't have to go through this tribulation. But we do look forward to seeing you again next time when we take this up. And uh, we thank you and ask that you will uh, be safe and uh, protect yourself. And we'll be meeting again within two weeks. God bless.